Hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. In this video, I want to try out this new precision machine level <clears throat> that I bought a year ago, maybe two years ago, that I haven't had a chance to use yet. So I'm going to clean out the X and Y axis slideways on one of my 1100s and adjust the gibs and see whether or not the uh, base casting that uh, houses the y-axis is twisted with this machine level. So a bit of maintenance and a bit of discussion about using a level on your machine. Cheers. So I want to use my new level to check out the straightness of the y slideway. You know that's the slideway that's machined into the top of the base casting. So first off I'll remove the vise and the covers and um, have a bit of a clean out to see what the ball screws like whether it's clean still or whether any dirt has been or swarth has been getting onto it um, if you're interested in these covers they're a really good way to keep the swarth from getting into your accordion or bellows covers and uh, that's uh, makes them easier to clean and also this back splash guard's really good to keep the swarth out of those accordion or bellows covers because uh, if it gets into there um, and you don't notice it it can jam in there and damage those covers and that's really important to avoid because underneath those covers is an exposed expensive precision ball screw and you don't want coolant or chips falling down onto that even minute quantities can really shorten the life of it so I've done videos on these covers back two or three years. If you're interested, you'll find some videos on that. So just removing that front cover now, it's really important to keep the dirty coolant from getting down into the ball screw, which is underneath here. So I put some thick grease on that uh, flange where the uh, accordion or bellows cover is screwed against the casting to make sure none leaks down there um, but we'll see in a minute because I need to strip it all apart to adjust the Y gibs or check them and adjust them if necessary and so I'll also check the condition of the ball screw to see whether it's getting any horrible grit on it. So far so good the underneath looks um, like it's not leaking coolant because coolant can carry fine grit so uh, it's, that's still as new and sealing out the coolant and the underneath looks in pretty good condition I think the old coolant has caused a bit of staining but the uh, oil seems to be getting onto the sliding surfaces and the ball screw looks superficially good although we'll have to wait and see as to whether it is microscopically clean so a few lines of defense to protect the slideways and the ball screw at the back, that splash guard that I showed you that was here. Then a sheet of uh, cloth underneath the accordion ways need to be kept free of swarth. You don't want to get a single hole in it because then it will leak coolant which has got abrasive particles in it down onto the ball screw underneath. And you want to use grease on the flanges on the ends so that you don't get any coolant leaking there. I know it sounds overly fastidious but these ball screws are valuable and important and a big job to change. Prevention is much better than cure. So even with that care it looks like the coolant is starting to get through. A few little micro cracks are appearing with age and letting the coolant leak through. I just hope not too much dirty coolant has got down onto that ball screw because that needs to be keeps that needs to be kept spotlessly clean if you want it to last a long time. So I'm really glad I've had this double cloth on top of it that's hopefully filtered out most of the abrasive material. So the slideways look pretty good. The sliding surfaces are all wet with oil. This top surface is corroded, but that's not a, it's got a bit of uh, rust on it, but that's not a sliding surface. And I do need to treat that with a rust preventative when I put it back together. So let's test the ball screw now and just see whether it is in fact 
as clean as it superficially looks. So I've just wrapped a clean brush cotton strip of linen around the ball screw, uh, right around it, um, and then uh, traversed it backwards and forwards several times, and just inspecting it, you can see that it's a little bit oily, it's got a little bit of staining, it looks like steel staining, steel wear staining in the oil, and a few little particles of swarth, which is disappointing, it's not immaculately clean. But I just um, console myself that it's a whole lot better than it would have been if I hadn't paid that attention and care. In the end of each, each end of the ball nut there is a little plastic uh, protector washer but I doubt whether that seals out the particles, the minute particles very well. Um, so you know, th this is what accelerates the wear of a ball screw and ball nut, is the little abrasive particles of grit and chips. And hopefully um, it's not too bad in this machine. I'll give it a, a good clean out with uh, kerosene and clean cloths and freshly oil it. Um, and give it a bit of a fresh start but you know um, there, there has been a bit of grit getting through even with all that care. So I wrapped a clean cloth around the ball screw from each end like that and then traversed it several times to get a sample of the surface of the ball screw. And again that's the front section again it's wet with oil which is good um, a bit of wear and yeah a little bit of a little bit of impurities there well I don't want to spend too long on this cleaning process because the main job today is to check the y-axis is straight and not buckled with my new level um, so I flushed down the ball screw, put some rags down the bottom there, flushed down the ball screw with some uh, kerosene, traversed it backwards and forwards several times, and then started to add whey lubricant, the slide whey oil, onto the ball screw and flushed it backwards and forwards several times, and then ran the uh, slide ways backwards and forwards, cleaning them and cleaning them and cleaning them, and pumping the oil through all the time. And I'm pleased to see that the new oil is coming through and uh, it, is, it is wet with oil. So I'm not applying additional oil superficially during this testing stage because I wanted to see whether the, the oil one-shot oil system is getting through to the slideways. And it seems to be getting through quite well still on this machine. So that's really good news. I know the advice is to stone down the surface of your table with an oil stone and kerosene from time to time before you do this type of work, but it's a bit of a two-edged sword. Don't forget you're leaving behind a residue of a, the worst kind of abrasive material, and you want to make sure it's really carefully wiped up, including in between the slots because it'll overflow down into the T-slots. And eventually that will get into your coolant, into your cutting oil, and eventually that will get into your slideways. And so um, you, that will increase the wear on your machine if any of that gets through. It's a very abrasive material such as aluminium oxide or silicon carbide, and you don't want that getting into your slideways or ball screws and nuts. I'm not sure how I should get how far I should get into this subject. Um, I've gone into it deeply two or three years ago in a video leveling your machine but it's a good idea for a machine to have three feet that do the main contacting on the floor so on this machine I've got um, two adjustable feet at the front and one foot right at the back in the middle that's a solid foot on, down onto the floor and then two outrigger feet that are actually clear of the floor while you make the adjusting 
process, during the adjusting process, and finally they're just brought down into light contact as emergency stabilizer feet. But the main weight of the machine is taken by three feet. And three feet is a huge advantage because it doesn't produce any buckling forces through into the stand. It just sits freely on the three feet because three feet pivot into position without putting any stresses in the stand. And stresses in the stand can easily transfer into stresses in the base. And stresses in the base can cause buckling and a twisting of the Y slideway. So with those two adjustable feet at the front, I can now level my machine. So let's talk about leveling the machine. So I've got this very fine bubble level and it's so fine that it's the graduations are two hundredths of a millimeter per meter. That's less than a thou per yard. It's a, almost too fine for me because it'll you know what it's like with an over sensitive indicator you can spend a lot of time chasing your tail but anyway this is incredibly fine this will measure a very slight tilting now just to reiterate that video I did a couple of years ago I'm not really using a level primarily to make the machine level I'm using a level to measure any discrepancy in the Y slideway the Y slideway is a long machined slideway and if it's buckled, for example, then the level is a very useful way to measure that buckle because the table will tilt to the left or the right as it's traversed. If you have a look at that bubble now, you can see it's pretty well in the middle, approximately in the middle, but if I traverse forward and backwards, I'm bringing it forward now. See the bubbles floating over to one side, to the right. If I travel right back, the bubble's going the other way. So that means that the Y slideway, this slideway, has probably got a slight buckle in it, a twist in it, if you like. Because the level is measuring the table tilting this way and then that way and the only reason it would do that or the most likely reason it would do that is if this Y slideway surface down here is got a twist in it and so what I can do is adjust these adjusting feet in the base with a shim under one side to reduce that twist and see if I can correct that problem. So you can calibrate these levels by rotating them 180 degrees and adjusting the internal level position until the bubble is in the middle in either position. Um, but for this application we're only using the level as a position comparator. We're comparing the levelness of the table at the front and at the back and at the middle to see whether it changes. So we don't have to have the bubble in the middle any more than have the level calibrated it's what its relative position is between one and the other so at the moment it's set pretty right I've got it dialed into there at the front of the y-axis there at the middle of the y-axis and there at the back of the y-axis well it's within one graduation which is an incredibly fine amount that's within uh, a couple of microns over the length of the level. So um, what I've got is a, is a comparative measurement between one position and the other. That's what we're measuring. So normally you would make that adjustment of untwisting the base by putting shims under either that mounting bolt or the one on the other side. Um, and I did that to get it approximately right when the machine was new but if you notice there there's a piece of plywood there underneath between the base of the machine and the stand piece of half inch plywood and that's covering the whole area and in addition to that I put these 
I, I, I drilled and counterbored these cap screws in the middle here. So I've got six mounting bolts with a sandwich of plywood between the base and the stand. And that means that I can fine tune the twisting of the base by just tightening up those bolts and loosening those bolts and, and in doing so crushing the plywood slightly and untwisting the base. So that makes it very quick and easy to make an adjustment to untwist the base with a very fine adjustment by just crushing and uncrushing the plywood. Now I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea but I thought I'd try it on this machine because it has the potential advantage of dampening vibration by having that uh, layer of uh, vibration absorbing material there and it makes adjustment easy but I'm not promoting it as an idea I'm not suggesting you do it it may or may not be a good idea in my video a couple of years ago called leveling your machine I use a tin to demonstrate the structure of a uh, of the Tormac uh, base of the machine that the sideways machined on because like this tin it's a very thin wall casting it looks substantial from the outside but it's hollowed out underneath and it's very flexible like this tin so if we put it down on the deck like that on the top of that base of course we have the Y slideway machined in there and that's precision machined and it sits on the stand of the machine with a bolt in each corner and the idea is that uh, you have the base of the machine bolted onto the stand in such a way that the slideway is flat and straight the y-axis is not twisted and it's very easy for it to be twisted because imagine if it's on uh, a, a level surface on three feet but one of the feet is not level when you tighten it up it buckles it like that and what happens when it buckles the or, or twists the uh, y-axis the, the y slideway twists as well as you can imagine and you only have to twist it a few thou and um, you've got serious errors in the slideway axes of your machine so it's a good idea to get this right you can put a little block in the middle initially then measure the distance under each corner because with a three-point contact as for the stand on the floor initially um, you won't be inducing any buckling loads because three points pivot into a relaxed position but as soon as you have four points then you can get buckling because the weight of the machine a heavy big machine on top of this very light flexible base will cause it to buckle if it's not positioned carefully so it's really important to get this leveled either with a three-point transfer measure the gap under each corner and then lower it down onto the appropriate shims or use a level as a position comparator between the front and the back as I've just demonstrated and that way you can twist the base back into a flat surface if it is twisted in the first place so you're basically untwisting it so you can imagine that if the Y slideway is twisted you can't get your gib adjustment right so you need the Y slideway to be straight and untwisted then you can do your gib adjustment so it's a good idea to do that first make sure you've got no backlash compensation so if you go to get access backlash check that you've got no backlash compensation applied put a dial indicator on the table and with a fine step go in one direction and then reverse direction and count the number of clicks until it starts to move you then have a measurement of how much loss motion there is then you can adjust your gib and you want to keep tightening up the gib and reducing the clearance in the Y slide way until you reach the point where there is more loss motion at that point you've got the gib too tight and you need to back it off a little so you want the 
the, the uh, gib as closely adjusted as possible without pinching and adding friction to the slideway. So by counting the steps in one direction and then in the other direction, getting the loss motion and then making the gib adjustment to get that absolute best compromise position. So in my case I brought the dial indicator up against the table, clicked it round with the finest step setting until I got to zero, entered zero in the DRO, changed the direction, clicked it back the other way until the needle started to move, looked at the DRO and it was 0 0.017. That's 1.7 hundredths of a millimeter. That's just over half a thou. That's not too bad. And I thought, well, maybe I can, uh, in, I can adjust the gib up a little bit closer without making that backlash any worse. So you can see there, there's a screw at the front and a screw at the back. Just going over this quickly, most of you will know this. It's wider at the front, therefore it's tapered smaller at the back. So I loosened the back screw off one turn tightened that in one turn, did the test again, and the loss motion had increased. That means the gib adjustment was now too tight. Uh, it increased from 1.7 hundredths to 2.4 hundredths, that's about a thou. So I, that was too much. So I then backed off half a turn, and at that point the loss motion went back to 1.7 hundredths, that's back to about half a thou uh, loss motion. So I've, I've increased the adjustment on the gib, reduced the clearance by half a turn on that screw and I haven't increased the backlash. So at, at that point um, that's about the best I can get it. So that's not too bad. Now if I wanted to I could an, enter a backlash compensation amount into Pathpilot um, but you really need to check it in different positions on the y-axis and find the absolute minimum position and uh, set that as a maximum in your backlash compensation. So while I was at it I adjusted the X backlash, went in one direction till the needle was on zero, reverse, uh, set the DRO on zero, reverse the direction, I got about six clicks of two and a half microns and then the needle started moving. That was 1.7 hundredths, just over half a thou again. So I tightened up the gib half a turn this time and it made it slightly worse. So I had the setting just about right. So I backed it off to quarter of a turn adjustment and uh, it went back to uh, 1.7 hundredths. So that, that uh, x-axis was about right. I've got it slightly uh, neater fitting now by quarter of a turn and the backlash is the same. So just over half a thou backlash or loss motion on the X and the Y and the gibs are adjusted up. Well after using this level for a while I'd wish I'd bought one that wasn't quite so sensitive. Two hundredths of a millimeter per meter is extremely fine and for workshop use it's just a bit too fussy and you're spending a lot of time chasing your tail. I wish I'd bought one a little bit more coarse, maybe one thou per foot. I think that's about what the uh, basic Starrett level is, machine level is. This one is really a bit too fine and um, you know these machines are just not in that class of work where you can work to that sort of accuracy. It's like using a one-tenth indicator or a two micron dial indicator. In, in a workshop application you actually waste a lot of time with an instrument that's too sensitive trying to achieve tolerances that you just can't achieve. This looks like the level that I bought. It's uh, two hundredths of a millimeter per meter. That's really too fine. You know, you just jump off the scale too quickly and you don't get a good sense of proportion. The trouble is that the Starrett ones that I was thinking of, they seem too coarse in the other direction. This is five thou per foot. Um, that's in a completely different league. It's really coarse. Um, I suppose you could use it you'd only be looking at a tiny amount of move, movement of the bubble. You really want one about, you know, um, one or two thou per foot. 
some something in between the two. Well, I thought this was the one. It says on the level 0 0.02 per 200 millimeters. That's about a thou per eight inches. It looks really good, but I think it's a bit um, confusing. I think they're actually referring to 0 0.02 per meter, which is the same as my one. Really fine. Um, so it seems you can get uh, too coarse or too fine, but I can't seem to find anything in between. If there's someone out there that has an understanding or expertise in machine tool levels, please post your thoughts in the comments below this video. It'd be great to hear. I know some of you will be thinking, what's wrong with a measuring instrument that's really very fine you just you know what the graduations are you, you just uh, make make the uh, measurement but the problem is that it goes off the scale too quickly and you lose a sense of proportion when you're working to unrealistically fine tolerances well i really want this uh, cover to be a bit more coolant proof because the coolant is carrying abrasive particles with it. So I, I remember, I've been trying to think of a way that I could seal it. And um, I remember my backpacking tent was silicon sealed. And I, I'm, this is pretty faint memory now, but I'm pretty sure I made a brew. I, I, I found out somewhere online that you can mix terps with turpentine, mineral terps, with silicon. And um, perhaps I shouldn't have put so much terps in. I blame the video for this. Not concentrating. Oh no, it's coming up about right. So I think from memory you can mix terps, mineral terps, with silicon. And so that you're thinning the uh, silicon down and then apply it, sort of paint it on. Now that worked on a, a nylon tent, so why won't it work on these bellows? I'm not sure what they're made out of. It's some sort of reinforced plastic. Uh, yeah, that, that's quite a bit runnier now. So that was about a 50-50 mixture of uh, mineral tips and silicon and now I can paint that on hopefully it'll dry and produce a a better sealed surface and uh, keep the coolant off that precious ball screw so I'll paint that on now and uh, let it dry and give you an update soon. Well, I might as well do it on the underneath as well. But I'll just do it in the central portion above the ball screw. It's a bit tricky getting at the ends. I don't know whether this will help much on the underneath, but another little coating on those troughs where the coolant sits can't hurt, can it? Who do you want to avoid getting abrasive particles on that ball screw? It's a danger in it being out of sight, out of mind. But the backlash on my machine is the same as it was years ago. So trying to keep these critical components from wearing and keeping them lubricated and clean can really pay you dividends. The next day, well, it's that's um, set. It looks okay. So that's just um, silicone and uh, 
mineral turpentine mixed up and painted on. Only time will tell how well it lasts, but it looks promising. So if you don't have a level and you want to set your machine base and y-axis slide weight in its neutral untwisted position, you can loosen off these two front bolts and raise the base up off the stand with a crowbar or some kind of a screw jack and uh, lower it down until the first corner comes in contact and at that point with it held with a wedge in the middle measure the gap under the other corner you know let's say it's 10 thou then put a 10 thou shim under that corner and bolt it up and that way you've used the three point contact transfer system to ensure that this main base y-axis slide weight is untwisted well it's possible that it is twisted but it's unlikely um, that's probably how it was if it was correctly machined that's how it was machined in the factory when the test certificate was produced and so it's probably going to be returned back into that state there is a very small chance that since the machine was made and the test certificate was produced that some stresses in the base have caused the base casting to become distorted and twisted and if that was the case the only way you could correct it would be with a level because you'd then be forcibly twisting it back straight again but that is quite unlikely that three-point contact transfer method is how I originally set the machine up and I'm just using this level to fine-tune it by compressing the uh, plywood base um, but it was essentially pretty close okay so now I'll test the X and Y slideways for square <laughs> So I've got that face in line with the x-axis. I know this angle plate is very accurate. It's within a tenth over four inches. So now I'll check the y-axis. Okay, let's see how square it is. Well, that's about two hundredths of a millimeter over 100 millimeters that's uh, just under a thou over four inches out of square that's not too bad for this class of machine I'm quite pleased about that if your X and Y axis slideways are out of square this can be caused by a twisted base casting it's quite confusing to think it through but if your base casting in the Y axis slideway is twisted it causes the whole thing to rock and it generates an out of squareness measurement with a dial indicator on a square or an angle plate and so that can be quite a trap uh, if you get the out of squareness it can be due to a twisted base casting it's a good idea to check that you're not getting any uh, direction change slop so that the uh, slideway is not racking in a twisting motion when you change directions on the y-axis and you can put a dial indicator down there change direction and that measures whether the y-axis is parallel and sliding in and out without racking and twisting on its uh, y-axis slideway if you want to know how you can measure your angle plate or square and tell exactly how square it is or how square it isn't um, have a look for a video I'm putting out I may have already put it out or I'll be putting it out soon squareness comparator how to make and use a squareness comparator and um, I was able to make that squareness comparator and check this angle plate and find that it was very close to square. An accurate angle plate is really useful because you can check 
check your uh, axes in all directions. So that's about three hundredths, almost, about a thou out of square over four inches with the side-by-side -side Z axis. Um, yeah, again, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's not too bad for this class of machine. I won't get into how you can adjust that in this video. It's already getting pretty long-winded. This time I'll put some LPS3 on the surfaces that were corroded, some long life rust inhibitor, so that I don't have that problem again. Well, there we are, back together. So I've got a cloth over the back so that the swarth doesn't get down into the little valleys of the accordion or bellows covers. I think that's a really good idea. Um, regarding that silicon coating, with the benefit of hindsight, I'll pass this on to you guys if you're thinking of doing it. You know, the Mark II prototype is always better than the Mark I prototype. I think this will work really well what I've done. but the trouble with silicon is, is it leaves a fairly tacky surface and you definitely, if you're putting it on the top surface, you definitely need to cover it with a cloth. Otherwise you're going to get all fine chips stuck on there, I suspect. So with the benefit of hindsight, I would keep the top surface free of silicon. I would have cleaned the underneath better with mineral terps and then painted on the coating underneath. Uh, let it sit in the upright position so that it forms a thicker uh, silicon on the bottoms of the troughs. That way uh, we won't have the problem. I think there might be a bit of a sticky surface here and I'll definitely need to keep a cloth over it to uh, stop the chips from sticking on that surface. So uh, yeah, um, I put grease on the ends of these covers there and there to seal it because you don't want coolant leaking through carrying the abrasive uh, particles with it. Um, it's, I think the original machine had four millimeter Phillips or posi drive caps, uh, caps, cap screws. I think you'd better to change them if you if you don't have hexagon head, change them to hexagon head. That way you can use a ball ended driver and get them in and out much easier because that's you know you want to make it as easy as possible to remove the covers if it's fiddling around with a Phillips screwdriver in there um, it puts you off doing it so it's worth changing it to a M4 button head hexagon I think it wants to be about 12 millimeters long that example is a little bit long it's just what I had to show you so that's what I do, knowing what I do now, knowing what I know now and what I'll do on my other machine is put the silicon coating on the underneath. So this cover I think is really worthwhile. You can see it's folded up there with some grease behind it. Um, that keeps the coolant from running down the back of it. It also stops the chips and coolant from getting through the front bellows and it's in much better condition than the rear bellows the rear cover so it's proving that it's working there's, there's no downside to it so um, I'd say it's really worthwhile getting that part folded up I've done a video on it uh, two or three years ago you'll find one on Tormac uh, covers or something like that so now I just need to drop that on got some better quality rust prevention on that surface and we should be good to go good idea to have a couple of little gauze filters above your coolant drain there because um, it extends the amount of time that it will run and drain away before it blocks up and also 
down the back here, screw in a couple of extension sleeves or glue them on with instant glue um, because otherwise the coolant will dribble out of there and with uh, surface tension run around underneath and carry the abrasive particles onto that slideway and eventually it'll get into the tersite coating and uh, it will wear a lot more rapidly than if the spout of coolant flows away clear of that area. Thanks for watching guys, cheers. Thank <laughs> you.